I'm going to talk today about the power of lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle medicine is using lifestyle changes not only to help prevent disease, which we all know, but to treat and often even reverse it. And, you know, we often think that to be powerful, it has to be a new drug, a new laser, something really high tech and expensive. And I think our unique contribution has been to use these very high tech, expensive, state of the art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low tech and low cost interventions can be. Uh, the program is has four main components. It's a whole foods plant-based diet that's naturally low in fat and sugar, uh, moderate exercise, stress management techniques that are uh, like meditation and other yoga-based techniques, and love and support, support groups and spending more time with your friends and family. Or to reduce it to its essence, to eat well, move more, stress less, and love more. And the more diseases we study, the more evidence we have to document what a powerful difference these simple changes can make. Uh, U.S. News and World Report rates everything from hospitals to clinics to medical schools to whatever. They also rate diets and they rated uh, what they call the Ornish diet as number one for heart health for uh, 10 different years, including 2021. So that was a nice vote of confidence. Oops, sorry about that. I don't know why this is getting hung up here. Um, we found these same lifestyle changes over many years. Uh, published in the leading peer-reviewed journals, could reverse the progression of a wide variety of chronic diseases. Coronary heart disease, we were actually the first to prove that heart disease could be reversed. At that time, uh, before then, it was thought that once you had heart disease, it could only get worse. Uh, we found we could not only stop it, we could even reverse it. Same with early stage prostate cancer, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, certain autoimmune diseases, high cholesterol, obesity. When you change your lifestyle, it actually changes your genes. We'll talk more about that. And, and lengthens telomeres, ends of our chromosomes that regulate how long we live. Now, what's interesting is that it wasn't one set of diet and lifestyle changes for this disease and a different one for another. It was the same for all of these. And that got me thinking, gosh, you know, with all this interest in personalized medicine, how is it these same lifestyle changes can have such far reaching applications and implications? And I wrote a book with my wife, Anne, who I've worked with now for over 20 years, called undo it. And uh, the undo button has always been my favorite button on the keyboard. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had one in our lives? And uh, now to a much larger degree than we thought we do. And in that book, and also in the journal of the AMA, which I'll be, uh, will be coming out with a, an article that I've written. Um, I present this new unifying theory that the reason why these same lifestyle changes can affect so many different diseases is that the diseases really aren't so different that they really have a lot more in common than they have different. And the reason is, is that they all share the same underlying biological mechanisms, chronic inflammation, changes in the immune system, overstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, the stress response, changes in the microbiome, the 100 trillion cells that live in our gut, oxidative stress, apoptosis, angiogenesis, gene expression, telomeres. And each one of these in turn is directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and how much love and support we have. Now, the guiding principle of all of this work for decades, I had this cartoon drawn in, the, in 1980, uh, that we spend so much time in medicine and really in life in general, mopping up the floor around the sink that's overflowing without also turning off the faucet. And sometimes you do need to mop up the floor. We've all benefited from drugs and surgery that can be life-saving when used appropriately. But all too often, they don't really also address the underlying causes, which are often lifestyle related. So when you get put on, uh, cholesterol-lowering drugs or blood pressure medicines or diabetes medications, and they say, they ask their doctor, you say, how long do I have to take these? What does the doctor usually say? Forever. How long do I have to mop up the floor? Forever. Well, why don't we turn off the faucet? And what I'm continually impressed by is that our bodies often have a remarkable capacity to begin healing, and much more quickly than we had once realized when we can treat the cause. Now, the other pandemic besides heart disease and diabetes is, light, is a COVID, not surprisingly. And these are studies that just came out in the last couple of months. One study, this is from the Harvard School of Public Health, and looking at over 600,000, almost 600,000 people, those eating a predominantly plant-based diet had a 9% lower risk of developing COVID and a 41% lower risk of, of getting severe COVID. Another study looked at frontline doctors and nurses who get exposed to COVID every day in six different countries. And they found that, again, those on a plant-based diet were 73% less likely and those following a fish-based pescatarian diet were 59% less likely to develop moderate to severe illness due to COVID. Whereas those um, who are eating like an Atkins paleo ketogenic diet high in animal protein 
were four, almost 400% more likely to develop moderate to severe illness. So again, it's not just walking into the wrong bacteria or virus, it's how your body interacts with that, which in part is a function of the diet and lifestyle choices that we make each day. Again, those who are, when you're sedentary, it more than doubles the risk of hospitalization or death due to COVID. So I began doing this long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, in 1978, when I was a medical student at uh, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, and I was uh, learning how to do bypass surgery with Dr. Michael DeBakey, who was really one of the pioneers of the inventors of bypass surgery. And we'd cut people open, we'd bypass their clogged arteries, and he'd tell them they were cured. And they'd go home, and all too often, they'd do the things that had caused the problem in the first place. They'd smoke cigarettes and eat junk food and be stressed and not manage extra and not exercise. And and, uh, and be lonely and their bypasses, their new bypasses would often clog up. And then they come back and cut them open, and do it again, sometimes multiple times. So for me, that became a, a metaphor of mopping up the floor without turning off the faucet. That you, if you don't treat the cause, the problem keeps coming back again. So I put, um, in the first study I put, let me just go back a set clogs, a uh, thing here. In the first study, I put um, 10 men and women in a hotel for a month and the blood flow to their heart improved in 80% of them. The second study was a randomized trial. We found that in just three and a half weeks, the ability of the heart to pump blood improved. And we published that in the journal of the AMA. Went to Boston, to Mass General and Harvard to do my medical residency and fellowship. Moved to San Francisco, joined the faculty at UCSF. Began the nonprofit Preventive Medicine Research Institute and began the most definitive study called the Lifestyle Heart Trial. And we used the state-of-the-art measures, quantitative arteriography to measure blockages in the arteries, cardiac PET scans to measure blood flow to the heart. Um, now, sorry, this got out of order here. Um, and what we found was that the arteries got more clogged after one year and even more clogged after five years in the randomized control group. That's used to be called the natural history of heart disease was to get worse and worse. What we found was that it was actually unnatural that if people made bigger changes than those most doctors had been recommending, they showed some reversal. The arteries got less clogged after one year, which we published in the Lancet, the premier international medical journal, and even less blockage, more improvement after five years, which we published in the journal of the American Medical Association. Those differences were highly significant. We found a 400% improvement in blood flow to the heart by PET scans in these patients. And it wasn't just a few people that skewed the mean, 99% of the patients who got the program stopped or reversed the progression of their heart disease, whereas only 5% of the randomized control group patients got better. Now to put a human face on this, this is one of the patients uh, more recently who uh, is a doctor himself, he's an internal medicine specialist, had a massive heart attack following a, a car accident. Uh, so much of the heart muscle was damaged that he could barely do anything. And the doctor said, the only way you're gonna stay alive is if we give you a new heart, a heart transplant, which is about the most radical intervention you can do in medicine. So while getting, waiting for a donor to be found, he entered our reversing heart disease program at UCLA, uh, where he lived in Los Angeles, to get in better shape for the surgery. But after nine weeks, he improved so much as the, the ability of his heart to pump blood improved so much, he no longer needed a heart transplant. So let me play this for you, just a minute and a half long. So the situation I'm describing here is of an internal medicine doctor who started a, a new chapter in his life with his wife moving to Lake Arrowhead, having just opened uh, a private practice office after all of our kids went to college and we could relocate. And just as this was ramping up, we had a horrible car accident which precipitated a heart attack that dropped my cardiac functioning down to basically uh, 11 uh, to 13 or 14, 15% of what it should have been, which resulted in intractable chest pain, angina, trouble breathing, inability to walk from room to room, go upstairs without being carried. I was offered a heart transplant as the only way to stay alive. And at the 11th hour, I entered the Ornish program, which provided me with the, an entire paradigm shift with respect to stress management, exercise, diet, nutrition. And despite not believing it myself and having other physicians who didn't believe in it either, it uh, worked beyond my wildest dreams. I'm now able to exercise moderately. I can work full time. I can live at 6,000 feet. And uh, our quality of life is actually better than it was before. I also uh, got a call from him just a couple of weeks ago saying that he had a test more recently showed even more improvement in his uh, heart. Now, 
a heart transplant is a million and a half dollars. Uh, you have to take immunosuppressive drugs the rest of your life. Um, so I ask you, what's the more radical intervention? You know, a heart transplant or eat well, move more, stress less, and love more. We then looked to see if these same lifestyle changes could reverse early stage prostate cancer. And we did a study with um, the heads of uh, urology at both US UCSF and at uh, Memorial Sloan Kevin Cancer Center. And we took men who had biopsy proven prostate cancer who'd elected to do watchful waiting for reasons unrelated to the study. So we could then randomly divide people into two groups and have one group that was uh, not getting an intervention, which you can't do with most forms of cancer because they're usually getting some kind of treatment. So we can look at the effects of lifestyle changes alone. And what we found was that the PSA levels went up or got worse in the experimental, in the uh, control group, went down or got better in the experimental group. We published that in the leading peer reviewed urology journal. These differences were highly significant. We found the tumor growth was inhibited by 70%, but only 9% in the control group in direct proportion to the degree of lifestyle change. This, by the way, is a picture of what reversing heart disease looks like. This is a narrowing that's less clogged after a year. And because the blood flow is the fourth power function of the radius, even modest changes, increases in the radius cause exponential improvements in blood flow. And you can see here blue and black at the beginning is a big part of the heart not getting any blood. Orange and white is maximum blood flow. Now, getting back to the prostate cancer study, you can see here the tumor activity is diminishing as well as the PSA coming down. And none of the experimental group patients needed surgery or radiation or chemotherapy during the first year but six of the uh, randomized uh, control group patients uh, needed that. So this was still, it was and still is the first and only randomized trial showing that lifestyle changes alone can slow, stop, and even reverse the progression of men who have early stage prostate cancer. So we wondered what some of the mechanisms might be to help explain these findings. And so we looked at their gene expression and we did the study published with Craig Venter, who was the first to decode the human genome. And we published this in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. We found that over 500 genes were changed in only three months. And in fact, turning on the good genes, turning off the bad genes. Uh, this is what, particularly the oncogenes, the, one, the ones that cause prostate, breast, and colon cancer were turned off. These are all genes that cause cancer. Red at the beginning is turned on. Green, uh, after just three months, is turned off. It just, again, shows you how powerful these lifestyle changes are. And after only three months, over 500 genes were changed. So. Our genes are our predisposition, but our genes are not our fate. And that's important not to blame, but to empower people. Because, you know, I've been taking, I've been one of uh, Bill Clinton's, uh, President Bill Clinton's consulting physicians now for many years. And 14 years ago, when his bypass was clogged up, his uh, cardiologist held a press conference on CNN and said, oh, his genes had nothing to do with it. His diet and lifestyle had nothing to do with it. I'm sorry, his diet and lifestyle had nothing to do with it. It was all in his genes. And I sent an email to the president. I said, you know, if it were all in your genes, you'd be a victim, and you're not a victim. You're one of the most powerful guys in the world. Um, and I say that's not to blame you, it's to empower you. And so then he began going on the same program. He's talked about this publicly. He's been doing it now for 14 years, and his disease is getting better, as he's talked about. We then did a study with Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel Prize for discovering telomeres, which are the ends of our chromosomes that regulate cellular aging. Uh, they, they're the ends of the DNA that they're kind of like the plastic tips on the end of a shoelace to keep your shoelace from unraveling, except they keep your DNA from unraveling. And as the DNA replicates over the years, the telomeres tend to get shorter and shorter. And as telomeres get shorter, your life gets shorter and the risk of premature death from a wide variety of conditions goes up. Um, she had done studies with Alyssa Apple showing that people who smoked or who under, were sedentary or chronically stressed or ate junk food, their telomeres got shorter faster. So I said, you know, if bad things make your telomeres shorter, maybe good things make them longer. So we found sure enough that after just a year, uh, five years, that the telomeres actually got longer by 10%. This is the first study showing that anything could lengthen telomeres, whereas they got shorter in the control group. And when the Lancet editors published this, they sent a press release out worldwide. And they said, this is the first study showing that positive lifestyle changes may reverse aging on a cellular level. And as we all get older, uh, that's increasingly meaningful. So that brings us up to can lifestyle changes help prevent Alzheimer's disease? Now we're, excuse me one second, we're doing a, uh, a study where um, we're looking at the effects of um, lifestyle changes on Alzheimer's. I think we're at a place with Alzheimer's very reminiscent of where we were with heart disease 40 years ago. In other words, the same biological mechanisms are in play. The less intensive lifestyle interventions may slow the rate of which you get worse, but that's more like the onset prevention pound of cure. We know what's good for your heart is good for your brain and vice versa. And so my hypothesis was that 
maybe people didn't go far enough. And if we made bigger changes, the same degree of change and the same types of changes that we found could reverse heart disease and prostate cancer and diabetes and so many other conditions, maybe that would be true for Alzheimer's as well. And as you know, there are no drugs that can even stop the progression of Alzheimer's. So if we could show that, and we're still in the middle of the study, it's too soon to say, uh, it, would be a, it would give a lot of people new hope and new choices that they don't currently have. Now you find the same kind of overlap that a third of Alzheimer's cases are due to seven risk factors, the same ones that you see with heart disease, high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, and being inactive, smoking, being depressed, and so on. Um, just something as simple as eating five or more fruits and vegetables a day could reduce your risk of cognitive impairment by almost 50%. Now, if a new drug came out that Merck or Pfizer had that could reduce your risk of, of cognitive impairment by 50%, you know, it'd be a multi-billion dollar drug. This is just, you know, fruits and vegetables. Um, somebody is walking a half an hour a day or for an hour or three times a week, cause so many new neurons to grow that the brain gets measurably bigger. It's called neurogenesis. Now, when I was a medical student, I was taught, you know, you only got a certain number of brain cells. And if you go and have a couple six packs on a weekend and kill off a few hundred or thousand of them, you never get them back. But we now know the brain has what's called neuroplasticity. The brain can regenerate in many ways. And one of the things that causes new blood vessels to grow, I mean, new uh, brain cells to grow is exercise. So does meditation. So does eating healthy. So does love and support. So we, again, we find these shared biological mechanisms around all these different disease states. Something as simple as having, uh, taking omega-3 fatty acids, which you find in algae or, or fish oil, uh, can reduce your risk of Alzheimer's by 60%. There's no drug out there that can do that. Again, this causes pennies a day and the only side effects are good ones. Uh, neurogenesis is some of my favorite things. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier about, uh, Lola was talking about what are your favorite things? Chocolate is one of mine and in small quantities, chocolate increases neurogenesis. So does tea, which I'm, uh, I'm drinking now, blueberries and so on. Whereas what's bad for your heart is bad for your brain. Saturated fat, sugar, and nicotine decrease neurogenesis. Uh, again, saturated fat and trans fat more than double the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease as well. It's bad for your heart, it's bad for your brain and vice versa. Uh, an inflammatory dietary pattern characterized by lots of red, you know, all the usual suspects, red meat, processed meat, fried foods, and lower intake of the good foods, whole grains, and so on, correlated with elevated what's called interleukin-2, which causes inflammation, and was related to a, a greater decline in reasoning and global cognition. So, Again, we're having a better understanding of why these lifestyle changes, whereas a higher intake of whole grains was associated with larger, in other words, these are part of your brains that control cognition, and they actually get bigger when you eat this way. You can actually reverse a lot of the changes in your brain, not all of them, but to some degree at least, more than we ever thought possible before. Bacteria populated in the microbiome have been shown to produce amyloid. The amyloid in your brain actually begins in your gut, so we're looking at changes in the microbiome in our research as well. The finger study um, showed that more moderate changes can slow the rate at which people uh, progress into dementia. So our theory was that more intensive changes might stop or, or reverse that. So uh, at Duke, they did a study where these are not people with Alzheimer's, these are people who had more generalized dementia. And they found that diet alone uh, was not significant, but diet plus exercise was. That's why we changed a lot of things at the same time because you get a synergy, one plus one equals four, not just one plus one equals two. Um, a number of studies have shown that when you substitute plant protein, like a plant-based diet, fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes for a meat-based diet, you get a double benefit. You not only are not increasing your risk, you're actually getting protective effects. There are literally hundreds of thousands of substances in fruits and vegetables that have anti-cancer, anti-heart disease and anti-aging properties. So you really get a double benefit when you make these lifestyle changes. At 50, people who meditate have um, brains that are almost eight years younger than those of control groups, just from meditation alone. So again, this is not to blame, but to empower. So then the question is, can we reverse the progression of early stage Alzheimer's disease? And I think we're at a place with Alzheimer's very reminiscent, as I mentioned earlier, that we were with heart disease. If more moderate changes can help slow its progression, maybe more intensive ones can stop or reverse it. So we're, we're looking, you know, I think I'm, let me see if I, here we go. So we're looking um, at, uh, we're, take, we're trying to recruit a total of 100 men and women who have early stage Alzheimer's disease, who live in the Bay Area. We're doing this in collaboration with our nonprofit Preventive Medicine Research Institute, 
uh, at UCSF, uh, with researchers there at Harvard Medical School and University of California, San Diego. We randomized people into two groups. We test both groups at the beginning. One group, we put them on this intensive program. And the other group, we say, just keep doing what you're doing. And then we test them again to see. And then after 20 weeks, the group that didn't get the program, now they get it as well. So both groups will ultimately end up getting the program. Now, Medicare uh, 10 years ago began covering the same program for reversing heart disease. That was a real game changer because when you change reimbursement, you change medical practice and even medical education. Now, just last week, excuse me, last two days ago, I should say, Medicare agreed to cover uh, the same program when it's offered virtually as when it's done in the bricks and mortar world. In our Alzheimer's study, we were meeting with people several times a week at our institute in Sausalito, but we had to stop doing that a year and a half ago when COVID hit for obvious reasons. So we've been doing it all by Zoom and it's been working just as well as when we met with them in person, which was a real surprise to me. And so now we're collaborating with the heads of neurology at Harvard Medical School and the Mass General Hospital, as well as at UCSD, where they're recruiting and testing patients there, but we're actually doing the intervention from here um, via Zoom, which now we can, because we found it worked so well with the Alzheimer's patients, we're now being able to do that with the, with the cardiac patients. This was the uh, Medicare decision that it took 16 years for them to finally agree to cover our program. They, it was something they'd never done before, so they really wanted to be sure. We have a team approach, a doctor, a nurse, a meditation teacher, exercise physiologist, dietitian, and psychologist. People come in our Alzheimer's study three times a week for four hours at a time. So it's a really, it's a big commitment, but again, it's hard to reverse a chronic disease. That's why no one showed it in these areas before because they didn't go far enough. You know, I love that um, moonshot speech that John F. Kennedy gave in the early 60s where he said, we're going to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And sometimes things that are hard are the ones that are most meaningful. I mean, many of you are parents. If I asked you, is that hard? You'd say, yeah, it was really hard. Would you do it again? Absolutely, you know, it's the most meaningful thing in, my, in most people's lives. So it's kind of like that. Um, we're looking at the three major tests that are used in all the drug trials, the FDA drug trials to see if people are getting better. Uh, we're also looking at other mechanisms, the inflammatory biomarkers of inflammation at Harvard, the telomere link with Dr. Blackburn who got the Nobel prize for her pioneering work with telomeres, the changes in gene expression with Dr. David Sinclair at Harvard and changes in the microbiome with Dr. Rob Knight at UC San Diego. We're doing this at no cost to the participants. We're actually providing 21 meals a week for the participant and their spouse or caregiver for 40 weeks of the study. We're spending literally millions of dollars on food, but I wanted to see you know, whether this works or not. And I knew that in order to get, if there's any chance that we're gonna show reversal, people are gonna to have to make, to follow the diet pretty much close to 100%. And the only way we could really assure that is to give everybody the food and say, just eat the food that we provide you. And then we figured like, even if we showed nothing, that would be important to know too, but hopefully that won't be the case. Um, one of the other things that we're learning is that Alzheimer's is really one of the most uh, isolating experiences. You know, you're, you know, you start to not like, what was that person's name? And like, um, you know, uh, you know what, what's going on here? And you start to forget things. You don't want to go out because you don't want to embarrass yourself. Next thing you know, the, the doctor is saying, I'm sorry, Mr. Jones or Ms. Smith, you've got Alzheimer's. Get your affairs in order. There's not much we can do. You know, if there's anything you want to do, do it in the next year or two, because that's probably all the good time you've got left. Uh, and by the way, we're taking away your driver's license, so your world shrinks even more. And then it just gets, uh, you know, a downward spiral, because when you take away people's hope, you know, they get depressed and they start to, the brain almost shuts down as an adaptive response. If you tell people, you know, your memories are only going to get worse, and at best we can slow down the rate at which it gets worse for a little while and not that much. Um, it's such an overwhelmingly horrible diagnosis that, your brain starts to shut down. It's kind of like you know an adaptive response because when you lose your memories, you lose everything. And study after study have shown that people who are lonely and depressed are three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely compared to those who have a sense of love and connection and community. So you become more vulnerable to other conditions as well. Whereas anything that brings people together is really healing. Uh, the root of healing is to make whole. You know, yoga comes from the Sanskrit to yoke, to unite, union. These are really old ideas that were that we're rediscovering. So our support groups are not just helping people stay on the diet. They're a powerful intervention in their own right. And especially with people who have Alzheimer's because they're so much more isolated than say people who have heart disease. Now, David Spiegel at Stanford did a wonderful study where he found that um, women with metastatic breast cancer who had a support group once a week, just for a year, five years later, they actually live twice as long. You can see here 
They live twice as long as those who didn't have the support group. Now a skeptic might say, oh, please give me a break. You mean talking about my feelings in a group is gonna help me live longer if I've got breast cancer? How could that be? But it's true because we are creatures of community. You know, what brings us together is really healing. And so the support groups in our study, which people often have the most skepticism about, invariably are the most meaningful part, and especially in people who are struggling with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Nicholas Krasakas at Harvard found that if your friends are obese, you're 45% more likely to be obese. If your friends' friends are obese, you're 25% more likely. And if your friends' friends' friends are obese, you're 10% more likely, even if you've never met them. That's how interconnected we already are. So we try to use that interconnectedness as part of the healing of, uh, of what we're doing. And it's not just obesity, it's pretty much everything. So, um, sorry, I'm the wrong, wrong thing here. If you're interested in uh, learning more about our Alzheimer's study or volunteering for it, if you have early stage Alzheimer's or know someone who does, uh, give our office a call and uh, you know, we'll see if you're eligible for it. Uh, we, we're still recruiting people uh, for a little bit longer anyway. So if this is something that you or someone you know might find meaningful, uh, please let me know. Uh, and, and for me, what's so exciting about doing this work is that enables us to use the suffering that people are experiencing as a catalyst or as a doorway for really transforming their lives for the better. That's why I'm still so passionate about doing this work, you know, 44 years later, because to me, there's nothing more meaningful than giving people a sense of hope. And properly done, research can redefine what's possible. And by doing so, you have literally millions of people new hope and new choices. So uh, let me stop here then. So Dr. Catherine Madison is uh, formerly the, the head of the Ray Dolby Brain Health Center at CPMC, a world-renowned neurologist in her own right. She's the chief of neurology at our nonprofit institute and collaborating with us on the Alzheimer's study. So I'm delighted to, uh, to be together with her today to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Dean. Uh, appreciate hearing all of your comments. Uh, and I think the entire audience does as well, and certainly you've demonstrated this research over decades and the whole country appreciates you and the world appreciates you for it. Thank you. <laughs> so I had an early question about prostate cancer, or not prostate cancer, but an elevated PSA, but I think, I think you answered that with your slides. And then I've got another question here, um, if, which I think is a perfect one for you to talk about. And that is this concept of uh, grain brain and inflammation and the gut brain axis and how it might be related to wheat. Can you address that for us? Yeah, it's kind of a subset of a bigger question about, you know, what's a healthy way to eat? And, you know, I debated Dr. Atkins uh, numbers of times uh, before he died of what turned out to be heart failure. Um, so, you know, uh, I stopped doing these kind of debates, but the confusion is always around the same issue, which is that people think carbs are bad for you. And there are two kinds of carbs. There are good carbs and bad carbs. The bad carbs are bad for you, hence their name. Uh, sugar, white flour, white rice, things like that. And the reason they're bad for you is when you go from whole wheat flour to white flour, a good carb to a bad carb, or brown rice, a good carb to a bad carb, white rice, um, you're removing the fiber in the brand. And the fiber in the brand ordinarily fill you up before you get too many calories. So you lose weight, which is good without having to be hungry. And they also slow the rate of absorption from your gut into your blood. So your blood sugar level goes up slowly and it goes down slowly when you eat brown rice or whole wheat flour. Whereas when you remove the fiber in the brand, it just goes straight up. So you get, it's like mainlining sugar. So when you eat a lot of sugar or white flour, white rice, your blood sugar spikes your pancreas senses it and it produces insulin to bring your blood sugar back down, which is good. But the insulin promotes chronic inflammation, which is bad and creates a number of these different conditions. So we all agree that uh, the bad carbs are bad. It's what you replace them with that we have differences on. And, you know, the grain brain people or the Atkins people or the paleo people or the ketogenic people or whatever, they replace the bad carbs with meat and uh, animal protein which is not a good thing because so many studies have shown that red meat promotes chronic inflammation and, uh, and increases the risk of, uh, of all-cause mortality, heart disease, diabetes, prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, et cetera. So grain brain is true to the extent that you're eating a lot of refined carbs or sugar, 
But the healthiest diet is one that we're talking about, which is a plant-based diet, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, soy products, as they come in nature. Then you get all the benefits of avoiding the refined carbs, but you don't get the harmful aspects of eating a, a lot of animal protein. And, and I've always shared with, with my patients, moderation in everything. You know, you don't want to overdo anything whatsoever. Um, now, I had another follow-up question on that, um, referencing something that apparently Dr. Perlmutter recently put out about a keto diet. Now, I had not, I had not seen that because I don't follow this literature closely. And so he apparently put something out saying that the, the keto diet would ameliorate symptoms related to Alzheimer's disease. And this, again, seems in opposition to your approach. Have you seen uh, that? Yeah, well, David Perlmutter wrote the book, Grain Brain, and uh, he's... Uh, He's all about that, um, but he's done no research to show that. I mean, that's why you know it's people can make lots of uh, money and other things by writing books that say tell people what they want to hear. But I have to tell you that um, if you talk about a keto diet as one that's low in refined carbs, we're in agreement. If you say let's replace those refined carbs with with red meat and grass fed beef and things like that, I'd say that's just wrong. Uh, because all the studies are showing that, that it actually increases inflammation. There's not a shred of evidence, for example, to show that grass-fed beef is healthier than regular beef. It's better for the cow, so to that extent it's good, but it doesn't improve your health by, by doing that. I have a wonderful cartoon of, uh, it's probably a little um, morbid, of these uh, cows being led off to the slaughterhouse, and one's cow is saying to the other, well, at least I can take comfort in knowing that by eating us, they're killing themselves, you know? <laughs> so um, <laughs> it's... Uh, there's, a, ner there's a, ner a nugget of truth in that, that yes, people are eating too many refined carbs, but what's what you replace them with that really makes the difference about whether it's gonna be healing for you or not. I would agree with that. I think we're, we're always looking for a balance. Uh, along that lines, uh, one of our participants is asking us to address exercise a little bit more. From what standpoint? Oh, just how it fi how it fits into the picture here. I mean, I generally, when when I'm talking with people, I will oftentimes say that of mm -hmm. the different pillars that promote brain health, I consider exercise to be the most, you know, the most important of these. And and so Dean knows this. I'm a bit of an exercise junkie myself, and I just feel it's really really important. And I will say to people, well, no one's figured out exactly what the right doses, if exercise was a pill that doctors could simply prescribe and patients could take it and get the benefit, it would be the most widely prescribed medication in the country. Um, right. Well, I, I agree that exercise is really important. I would not agree that it's the most important. I think their diet is also important. Stress management is important and um, social support is important. I think they're all important. I wouldn't uh, they're say- They're all that. important. Yeah, More no, I agree with you. Others. But yeah. I would say that exercise is one of the most uh, studied things about dementia. And, and, and clearly, it's a good example of the unifying theory, because it's not like you have to do one kind of exercise for heart disease, a different one for diabetes, a different one for Alzheimer's, a different one for mm -hmm. uh, prostate cancer or breast cancer. It's really the effects of exercise are far reaching. And there are different kinds of exercises. You know, there's the aerobic exercise, you know, walking is a good way to do that. And walking half an hour a day can give you many of the benefits of more intensive exercise, particularly if you're older, while minimizing the risks. Uh, strength training is also important, some kind of resistance training, like with weights, for example, especially for building muscle mass and for reducing uh, osteoporosis and more, more bone density. Uh, and stretching is also important. It's lengthening those chronically stressed muscle groups because uh, when you're chronically, you know, part of the fight or flight response, as you know, is that your body tenses up so that if you get hit, it doesn't hurt as much. And that's survival value. Mm -hmm. But if it's chronically activated, if you're stressed all the time, then your muscles get tensed all the time and they tend to cause back pain and falls and other things that are really an issue for older people. So when you slowly and gently stretch out in a yoga type stretching, uh, you're not only just as your mind affects your body, your body affects your mind. And it not only relaxes your muscles, but it relaxes you in general. So exercise is one of the most uh, helpful things that you can do. What type of exercise should you do? Um, if you like it, you'll do it. So find something that you really enjoy. For me, I grew up in Texas and running was always punishment. Like go take a lap, you know, where push-ups were punishment. Go, give me 50 push-ups, you know. But um, I, now I love to swim because swimming was always fun. So I swim every day or almost every day um, because I like it. So I just found that do what you like. And that's really the most important thing because if you like it, you're going to do it. 
And I support. I agree with your answer 100%. Uh, the, the general recommendation is about 150 minutes of a cardiovascular type activity that's spread throughout the week. And I will tell people it can be any kind of an activity that you enjoy. And uh, I ask them to exercise enough that they are mildly short of breath in conversation so that if someone's talking to them, they might, like they were talking on the phone, someone would say, are you walking or something? So being mildly short of breath in conversation or breaking out in a light sweat. And for that 150 minutes a day, you don't want to do it all at once. You want to try and spread it out throughout the week. I, like Dean, love swimming. And I recommend that a lot for seniors because no matter what kind of joint issues you've got, water is always the best to get a good workout in. So uh, then we had another question asking if you could talk a little bit more, and I'm not sure if you're, if you're comfortable with this, I, I'm afraid I'm not, um, talking about just gluten sensitivity. Well, some people are gluten sensitive. I mean, and, and uh, I think it's a much lower percentage than most people think, you know, for people who have, um, you know, true gluten enteropathies, it's, it's, it's a much smaller part of the population, but some people are fine that when they eat gluten, they get more inflammation. And so... If you think you're one of those people, there are lots of gluten-free uh, alternatives out there that uh, you can try that and just do an end of one study and find out for yourself whether that's making a difference or not. But I wouldn't assume that you are because you'll end up missing out on a lot of things that are, uh, that are enjoyable that may be good for you. So you can just test yourself and say, okay, I'm gonna eliminate gluten for a week or even for a few days. See if you notice any difference. If you do, then continue it. If not, then go back to eating it. I think that's a, I think that's a good answer. Um, I actually did do that once when on a com completely gluten-free diet. Uh, I didn't really see a difference uh, until maybe two or three weeks, um, you know, but it is individual. Uh, not, not that many people have true celiac disease, although some certainly do. And then I have someone who was asking a question about asking if uh, playing their violin is exercise and it absolutely <laughs> is exercise for the brain so when we're, we're talking about physical exercise but we also want cognitive stimulation our brains are hardwired to seek out novel and different things and so you, you want something that is engaging to you that draws you out and that also goes to what dean talked about earlier in terms of support and community would you agree with me on that definitely and if you um you know, or at a hoedown or something, and you play the fiddle fast enough, you can get some good aerobic <laughs> exercise there too. <laughs> oh boy. Okay, hang on one minute as I'm sorting through questions here. Um, so I've got, a, I've got a question asking about drinking, drinking water um, and that medical professionals do not think it's necessary I think it's necessary. Uh, you know, I mean, certainly you don't want to drink so much water that you dilute your blood and your sodium drops. But um, I, I definitely think you drink want to drink a lot of water. I recommend uh, generally 50 or sound ounces or so a day. What are your thoughts, Dean? Well, as people get older, their thirst uh, response uh, sometimes diminishes. So it's not uncommon for older people to get dehydrated because they're they just don't have the thirst that tells them to drink. So to that extent, I think it's good. But um, I, you know, like anything, you, you don't want to drink too much water for all the reasons you've been talking about. And if you can also um, take a, get a blender or a juicer and uh, take some vegetables and juice them and, and have a green juice, uh, or, you know, you can get them now, uh, you know, even DoorDash will bring them to you. Um, that's a good, a good thing to be drinking uh, and not just necessarily water per se. Uh, I agree with you on that. I, and I will oftentimes uh, advise people that they should pour out a pitcher of not necessarily water. It can be other sorts of beverages. Um, we all are advocates of green tea um, and that they try and fill a pitcher in the morning and make sure they finish it before the end of dinner because people don't want to have a full bladder when they're sleeping at night that will then disrupt their sleep because sleep is important for our brain's health as well. Yeah, um, sleep is really I important. Sleep really is where your brain detoxifies. So um, I'm glad to see that many people are realizing that the culture of, oh, I only need four hours sleep a night, you know, I'm such a macho person, I can get so much done, um, is beginning to really change. Uh, Bill Clinton once said that uh, the, decision, the, the worst decisions he made were the ones when he was sleep deprived. So it's really uh, one of the best things you can do is make sure you get enough sleep. 
there was actually just a, a very large uh, review study looking at quantity of sleep as well, because people are always asking, well, what's the right exact right number, like exercise there. We don't know what the exact right number is. However, it certainly looks like it's between six and eight hours of sleep. And you want to have it as, as uh, deep and uninterrupted as possible. Um, I have someone here who is saying that at 90, they're having trouble coming up with names, but they can oftentimes remember initials and what might explain that. And I actually have spoken about how as we, as we age, indeed, we do have more trouble coming up with specific words. We have trouble coming up with the sounds for words. We, can, we know the context of the word. We know what it is we want to say, but we're actually having trouble retrieving from different areas of the brain exactly what sounds make that word up. So unfortunately, that difficulty coming up with a specific name is something that we see more commonly with aging. Uh, I'm getting well, a couple. I was going to say, sorry, what, go ahead. I'm sorry, I thought you were done. Please continue. Oh, no, I was going to move on. What did you want oh. to say? So um, sometimes if you forget someone's name, uh, you get anxious. Oh my God, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm getting Alzheimer's. Oh, I'm getting dementia. You know, even at, you know, 30 or 40 years old, you know, people start to worry about that. Uh, but I find that the worrying about it becomes self-fulfilling, that you are afraid you can't remember something and the, and the anxiety around that keeps you from remembering it. So if you can't remember someone's name or a phone number or something, try a little experiment, say, oh, it'll come back in a moment. I'm not gonna worry about it. And chances are it will. So um, just that's worth a try. And I agree with that as well. So I have someone else who's coming back again though, asking if you can give some examples of good grain options that don't have gluten. That don't have gluten? Um, you know, uh, couscous is a, one of my favorites. Um, quinoa is a complete protein, which is nice. Um, if you just simply Google uh, or, you know, whatever search engine you use, uh, grains that don't have gluten in it, you'll get a whole list of them. So I, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm getting several questions just about the study. And um, un unfortunately, our top age in the study is 90. So um, people who are 90 are not eligible to join our study. Um, but reaching out to us and, and Dean, did, did you provide um, Lola with contact information so that people can get it, uh, get that after the uh, presentation here? Yeah, I put it in my presentation. I can give it again. It's probably worth repeating. It's uh, if you just uh, go to either PMR, if you go to Ornish.com, my name.com, that's the easiest way to remember it. That'll take you to our PMRI website, which talks about the Alzheimer's study and shows how you can sign up for it. Or you can just dial our office. It's 415-332-2525. Uh, and we're, if you dial extension 255, uh, that'll reach one of the researchers who can uh, uh, help determine if you're eligible or not. But we're still recruiting. Everything is done at no cost to you. Uh, like I say, we provide 21 meals a week for 40 weeks to you and your caregiver, as well as all the training. So it's, um, it's a really wonderful opportunity for everyone. Um, we're looking for people who have early Alzheimer's disease, but not so far advanced that it's gonna make it harder for them to show improvement. Right, and it is all being done as a virtual intervention. Um, and it, the only time that people do come to the study site, which is in Sausalito, is for cognitive testing. Um, and that's done at the beginning. It's done at 20 weeks and 40 weeks. So the rest of it is all virtual. So we are recruiting people from, well, how far away are we going, Dean? <laughs> <laughs> We've taken people as far away as Oregon, but uh, it's best if you live in the Bay Area or in Boston or in San Diego, we're now, we're collaborating with the people there as well. Okay. Now we have a question about caffeinated green tea or decaf green tea? Yeah, I, I'm, um, I'm very caffeine sensitive. I mean, if I have even decaf green tea, I'm like Robin Williams on cocaine. Um, you know, I, I talk a mile <laughs> a minute. It's like, hurry up, get out of my way, you know? Uh, so I, I, I don't do well with caffeine, but my wife can have a double espresso before bed and go be asleep in 30 minutes. So there's a, 
Uh, there is a genetic variability in how efficiently your body can metabolize caffeine. So do what's right for you. But the thing to remember is that caffeine doesn't bring you energy. You're just borrowing energy when you drink a cup of coffee or tea um, with the caffeine. It, 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 like all your neurotransmitters go off, but then later in the day, you get that kind of low feeling. You kind of go up and then you go down and you don't go down just to where you started. You go down below where you started, like a pendulum. If you hold it to one side, it goes to the other. It doesn't just stop in the middle. And there's a real good cure for that low feeling, which of course is another cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. When we used to do residential retreats, we'd ask people to quit drinking coffee and tea and they got so irritable and so grouchy in the first few days, they were literally going through withdrawal. If you don't think you're addicted to coffee, just stop drinking it and you literally go through withdrawal. Michael Pollan writes about that a lot in his, uh, in his new book. So, um, but on the other hand, green tea, in fact, any kind of tea, black tea as well, has a lot of anti-cancer properties. So you, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the polyphenols in there, Throughout your, whether it's cancer of your, your mouth, your, your uh, esophagus, your stomach, your, your intestines, your colon, your anus, anything along your whole GI system, drinking tea can really substantially reduce your risk of, of cancer. So I highly recommend it. And I can say from having worked with you for over a year, uh, year now, Dean, um, guys, he, he goes a mile a minute, no caffeine, trust me. <laughs> yeah. It's just his normal state. Yeah, you don't um, want to be around me. If I have a cup of coffee, my wife will say, come back in a few hours, we'll talk then. <laughs> um, uh, this is an interesting question here. Someone is asking if you have any suggestions for an individual who already leads a healthy lifestyle, but still has noted they have a tendency towards inflammation. Now, I'm assuming that this individual may be referring to like skin, which is one of the easiest ways for us to you know, see that we have a tendency towards inflammation. Do you have any suggestions around that? Well, you know, it's, um, it, it's all relative. Um, in all of our studies, we find the more you change, the more you improve. And what the reason, as I mentioned earlier, why we were able to show for the first time that so many of these different conditions could actually be reversed, heart disease, type two diabetes, early stage prostate cancer, is that it requires really big changes. It truly is ounce of prevention, pound of cure. So if you're just trying to stay healthy, lose a few pounds, get your cholesterol, blood pressure down a few points, moderate changes may be enough. What matters most is your overall way of eating. But, you know, sometimes you have to be, you know, moderate about moderation. Um, you know, it takes really big changes mm -hmm. to reverse conditions. And so if whatever you're doing now, you're still having some issues with inflammation, try making bigger changes. You know, if you're eating, you know, fish and chicken, give up the fish and chicken. You know, if you're eating some amounts of sugar and refined carbs, try to eat fewer of them. If you're not exercising, start doing that. If you're not meditating, try that. And if you, particularly if you try all these things at the same time, one of the paradoxes that I've learned over the years is that I was told, and I always thought that small changes are easy and big changes are really hard. But, you know, there's traditional cardiac rehabilitation and there's intensive cardiac rehabilitation. Our program is intensive. And there are data that keep coming out that show that we're getting 96% of the people who start our intensive program finish it after 72 hours, nine weeks later, whereas the adherence to regular cardiac rehab, which is really just exercise alone, is more in the 30 to 40% range. And people say, well, that's crazy. Why is it easier to make big changes than small ones? That's just counterintuitive. And the reason is, is that if you're making small changes, in, in many ways, you're not really getting much benefit that you can experience. You know, you'll feel a little better, but not a lot better. If you've got heart disease, for example, exercise alone isn't going to get rid of your chest pain in most cases. But if you make really big changes, particularly if you do it all at once, most people find they feel so much better so quickly, their chest pain goes away, for, for example, 90, over 90% 90 of the time in just three or four weeks. And so if you can't, you know, walk across the street without getting chest pain or make love with your spouse or play with your kids or you know, um, go back to work without getting chest pain. And within a few weeks, like the guy in the video that I showed, you're able to do all those things. And people say things like, well, you know, I like eating junk food, but not that much because what I gain is so much more than what I give up. Fear is not really a sustainable motivator. For a month after someone's had a heart attack or stroke, they'll do pretty much anything what their doctor has told them. And then they stop because we all know we're going to die. It's just a question of when, right? That mortality rate is still 100%. It's one per person, but it's not something we think about most of the time, unless we've had a an event like a heart attack, for example, then you think about it all the time, but then the denial comes back. It's just too hard to think about it all the time. And so when you, when focusing on trying to say that we're gonna prevent something bad from happening years down the road, like a heart attack or stroke or whatever, is really not sustainable. 
I used to get into friendly uh, debates with Al Gore years ago when an inconvenient truth came out because I said, you know, you're going to really galvanize people's attention, but it's going to be hard to sustain that if you talk about how the whole world is going to melt down in 10 years. It's just so overwhelmingly horrible that people just tune out, you know, whereas if you can focus on the short term games that come when you change your lifestyle. You know, you feel better. You think your brain gets more blood. You think more clearly. You can develop new brain cells for neurogenesis. Your skin gets more blood. You look younger. Your heart gets more blood. Even your sexual organs get more blood in ways in the Game Changer film that James Cameron did uh, showed just how, what a powerful difference it can make on sexual function in the same way that Viagra looks for people as they get older. So when people can connect the dots to what they do and how they feel, yeah, I like eating junk food. Boy, I sure like feeling this way and thinking so clearly and being able to do all these things then it really becomes sustainable. And I will have to agree with uh, Dean there. When you really do eat well like that, you feel so much better. It is a vegan diet. That means no yogurt. That means no eggs. It, it's no animal products. It's a completely plant-based diet. And once again, I, um, I'll say just to answer one of the questions here is that we are specifically looking for people who have a diagnosis of either an early Alzheimer's disease or a mild cognitive impairment that is felt related to an underlying Alzheimer's process. So those are the people we are looking for in the study. Um, Good. Well, I'm so appreciate the chance to uh, collaborate with you both here, Dr. Madison and in our, in our work together. Uh, Lola, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, share this information. I hope that it's been useful. And if anyone has or knows someone who might be eligible for our study, go to Ornish.com. The homepage will link you to our, our research site, and uh, we'd love to meet you and uh, see if you're eligible. So thanks so much, and uh, enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. Thank you, Dr. Ornish and Dr. Madison. We really appreciate all of your expertise and sharing that information with us. Again, this um, session was recorded. It will be emailed out to you next week. And um, I wanted to share just a little bit more information because this is a series, a brain health series. So today's was how lifestyle can impact your brain. Again, that recording you will have next week. And then on the 18th of November at 2 p.m., we will have uh, Dr. Uh, Janet Meiselman um, talk about matters of the mind. So she's a licensed clinical psychologist who works with adults and finds healthy ways to adapt to aging. And um, it, you know, it's, this is one of those um, things that I find really uh, fascinating. I mean, all, all of our speakers I find fascinating, but when we get into our mindset and how our attitude impacts our health, um, this is just gonna be really um, mind opening, <laughs> pun intended. Um, so I wanted to let you know that we will go ahead and register you for next, um, the next webinar. Uh, all of our webinars are listed at sequoialiving.org slash webinars. And also check out uh, Senior Services in Northern California at seniorservicesnorcal.org. And you can see all of the different um, programs that are supported there. Um, and then that's all for today, folks. I really appreciate your attendance and um, let us know how else we can help. Again, you'll get an email next week with the recording of today's session. Take care.